<laughs> so in your daily life, you're battling integration. And you're battling it on multiple levels as hopefully it's becoming clear. The battle is going on constantly and it's in your soul. And you really don't even have enough time. Because you have to make instant decisions all the time. You don't even have enough time to research or figure out whether the decision you're making is really the right one. You have to guess. And, you know, for a long time, my pastor talked about this using different words. He called them doctrinal instincts. Instincts are things that are the result of uh, what do you want to call it? Repetition. Like when you brush your teeth, it's instinctive because you've done it so much. When you take a shower, go to the bathroom, or even drive a car, you've done the same steps over and over and over so often that it just, shoot. okay? The fact that it is that fast, though, also means that you are constantly making decisions based on, you know, really inadequate information. But you have to. So, you know, what I'm trying to paint here is the picture of the real spiritual life and its real importance. Because it's really like fighting. It is fighting. But you get used to it. It's really being what, you know, we used to call Christian soldier. But, you know, Christians don't know what that really means. It's inside the soul. The battle is in the soul. You're constantly trying, you're battling with an integration with the world without God. You know, going just lateral. Versus going to God first. I call this a sequencing problem. The way, and I, I don't do it right, okay? I just know what the problem is. Everything I say is something I know, but that doesn't mean I live it. i got to keep repeating that. Don't think I'm a good Christian just because I know the material. Okay? Knowing it is the first step. Paul was talking about that in Romans 7. And obviously Paul knew doctrine. He knew it so well, he could just sit between two guards and write it. You know, that's the prison epistles. You know, they're wrong about Ephesians. I don't think that was a prison epistle. I think it was published because he went to jail. Okay. That he wrote it before. Possibly up to two years before. You know, at least the first chapter. But the the point I'm trying to make here is, you, your knowledge is getting developed, and it's always partial. And the Bible knowledge in particular is huge, and you have to get it in and in and in and in over and over and over and over and a lot of it before you even start to have a sort of big bird you know, overview the big picture before the big picture starts to even coalesce in your mind, especially because your typical Christian is being bombarded with the lie of brother foot. The lie, you know, that's in First Corinthians 12, the lie that Christianity and spirituality is something you do. It's not something you do. It's a word you learn. What did Jesus do? Well, it's really what word Jesus did. You can't do a word until you get it in you. That was the point of the letter of James. Okay? The word has to be implanted. And what James said in this very first chapter is use the implanted word. If it's implanted, it means you're saved. Okay, it's planted, but is it growing? The first word, of course, is the gospel. It gets planted in you. So it got planted. You believed it. Okay, but what are you doing with it? Is it being watered? Is it growing? Or is it dying before it even, you know, sprouts? And that doesn't mean you, you lose your salvation. It means you got saved and that's all. That's the whole point of the book of James. Because when he gets to chapter 2, he's talking about Abraham's maturation title, friend of God. So the whole letter is about grow up in Christ. Okay? Well, like a seedling, the seed has to break open. That's a battle. Then the shoots have to come up, and they have to struggle against the soil that's weighing them down. 
And they have to do it with or without water. Water of the word, hello. Okay? And only if they get the water enough are they going to be able to push and push because, you know, water dissolves the soil. And it's the water dissolving the soil that gives the, the plant that's starting from the seed the nourishment to keep growing. The seed has some nourishment in it. The, the, the seed basically softens and breaks due to water in the soil. And then when more water dissolves the soil, the nutrients come apart. The seed, as it were, the plant that's coming out of the seed eats the nutrients that are dissolved in the water. And then it can push up because the dissolving in the water also dissolves the soil. It's a battle. Everything in life is a battle. Okay, so if you're battling, your, your real life is to battle and grow. Christianity is touting it as something you do. It's not. It's something you learn. Okay, fine. But you don't just sit there on a park bench and learn. You can't even do that. You have to eat. You have to sleep. You have to wear clothes. You have to eventually get a job. All the rest of that stuff. So you are constantly doing something. God's going to use the learning and the doing to integrate them together. As I've been trying to explain. But it's the focus in the Bible is on what word Jesus did. You do a word, that's also at the end of James. I want to say it's um, at the end of James 2. You do the word by hearing it, believing it, and using it. You don't just hear it and forget. That's what James was talking about where you, you, know, you hear the word and you forget it. It's like looking in the mirror and then you forget what you look like. The mirror is the mirror of the word. The word shows you to you. It shows the world to you. It shows God to you. Okay, now what do you do with that? Okay, but you can't do anything with it until you know it. And you can't even know it right away. So you're like sitting blind under your teacher for I don't know how many years before it starts to gel. And most Christians are going to fall away and stop listening. Or they'll just start thumping their Bibles or get into religion and, you know, good deeds and all that other claptrap. Okay, so you got to learn and learn and learn and learn. And hello, what do we know about Christ? Not very much until he was 30 years old. And when he's 30 years old, he gets tested by Satan. The first thing he did. And what did he really do there? He talked. Satan talked to him. He talked back. Satan tried to get him to sin. He said no. And Satan was tempting him all three times to do good deeds. And what did he say? You live only on the word of God. You don't tempt God. And you le and then the last one his his argument back to him was, you know, just go. Only God do you serve. See, those were all knowings. Okay? Satan was tempting him to do something. He responded by things he learned. That's you too. That's me too. I know it. I know God really well. I know scripture really well. Well, what do you do? What about my doing? Because I have a body. Because it's a coordination outward laterally to the world. I'm not so good there. I'd give myself like a D. If I were to grade myself right now. Scripture knowledge, A. Ability to execute it, about a D. That's not good. Maturity isn't complete until the fat lady sings. And if it doesn't get executed in the body, then it didn't integrate. You see the point? So what God's cleverly doing is he's, this is why I keep talking about how do you do this? How do you live the spiritual life? Every day you learn something in scripture, ideally. And then try to do it like immediately. Use what you learn on whatever you're doing. I'm washing dishes. Can I, what scripture applies to washing the dishes? What scripture applies to peeing in the toilet? What scripture applies to washing, you know, my body? What scripture applies to making an email? Use it everywhere. That's integrating it into your body. That's a battle because it's not easy to answer those questions.
It's not even easy to remember to ask. And that's why I'm talking about sequencing. Because what you need to do is get in the habit of even asking what scripture applies. See, when Satan was tempting Christ, he threw out a proposition. The first thing you see Christ do, the sequence in his head. Okay? Obviously, it spent the 30 years learning scripture. Because the first sequence in his head is to look up to the Bible, to look up to scripture, to look up to God. So much so that Satan wasn't even able to tempt Christ to imagine bread, even though he's hungry. Talk to anybody you want, they'll tell you that when you're hungry, if somebody brings up some word that has a food image to go with it, you'll imagine it. If Christ did that, since he's God, the, the stones would have, would have been bread. Because God thinks a thing and so it is. He doesn't have to speak it. You know, because God doesn't have a body, so he doesn't have a mouth. doesn't need one. Christ is God, man. He didn't need to say it. But Satan is, you know, you, if he even imagined speaking stones into bread, they would have turned into bread. Satan knew that. Christ obviously knew it too. But what's the first thing he thinks of instead? The word bread is associated with Bible, and so his reply to Satan was Deuteronomy 8.3. You don't live only on bread, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's what the word bread reminded him of, a Bible verse. So the sequence in Christ is God first, Bible first, word first what word Jesus did that's what we got to get to that's the integration battle and I'm terrible at the sequencing you know it happens more often now than it did two years ago so much so that he can actually interrupt me while I'm talking when I'm not thinking toward him and I know he's interrupting of course, it would be better if I was thinking toward him first and the words that come out of my mouth were already cleared. Now, I'm not doing that. I just talk off the top of my head. Which, of course, you know, John 14 says you can do. It's not just John 14. You know, Christ said, don't even worry about what you're going to say. And I just use one John 9 so I won't have to worry about it. And he's, he's, he's doing that integration pretty well, because after I make these audios, I listen to him, I'm like, oh, that's true, that's true, that's true. So he's obviously doing it, and I'm trying to remember to use 1 John 1 9 while I talk. That's a coordination issue. That's an integration issue. But the sequence ideally would be, before I open my mouth, I look to him and like, wait for the word that he wants me to speak to come out and, and know that before I speak. It's not happening yet. And sometimes I'm actually wait, trying to hear him talk while I talk to you or this tape recorder. And sometimes it works. And sometimes I'm not even doing that. And sometimes, obviously, he interrupts me. When you hear me say, what was that? That's an interruption. And he's doing it a lot more lately than he used to. So that's a sequencing argument, the issue. And he'll do it to you. I'm no different. I'm an example. Okay, I'm doing this as practice. What God is going to do with it is show you how that practice works. That's part of the reason why I make these audios. Because for some people, this is very useful. I don't know who's listening to this, and it's not my business. My job is to practice. That's a sequencing thing. That's an integration thing. Okay, fine. You can sequence it so that ideally your thought first goes to God. All right, what should I be thinking, Dad? And then if you're going to talk, you're first waiting for God to, to cause you to know what you should say. But you've got to make your decision fast. Like I said at the very beginning. You've got to make your decision instantly. How do you know if what you're saying is what God wants you to say? And all I can really tell you on the inside, and you've experienced this too, you just have an urge to say something. And it seems right while you talk. But that's a lower level integration. Okay? 
but it is an integration between the knowing, which took a long time to build in you before you can speak it out. And then when you speak it out, that's only one level. And then that itself, the speaking it out, has a, you know, higher and higher and higher maturation that it needs to go through. But then on top of that, living it out. Living out what you know. Living out what you can say accurately. Doing that is like impossible. It really is. So you just keep aiming at it. And Paul himself said that. And he just threw that at me. What was that? Philippians 3.14 And uh, onward to the goal I march. In other words, I'm not there yet. You keep aiming at it. Katasko pon to the okay. I still rabbin to the goal. Dioko was I march. no to the upward call is how they translate it. Um, Tesano um, Klesius Tutiu of God in Christo Jesu in, by means of in agency of and in Christ. Okay? So that, as you just saw, is a sample of the integration ramping up. He throws it out at me and I heard it while I was talking. So now both things are happening at the same time. I'm talking and I'm hearing. And I say it. Okay, but do I actually live that way? Sometimes. So you never make it. But like I just, he just caused me to quote to you from the Greek. Okay. Those are the actual Greek words in the verse. The integration can sometimes be high. And a lot of times it's not. And what I covered in the last increment is that you got the vertical integration with God going on, and then you got the lateral integration with the world, and you need to integrate with God in the proper sequence. So it's like Him saying, and you know Him approving whatever you do while you're doing it in your thoughts. But then you've got to do it with your body too. Meanwhile, you've got everybody and his brother and all these other things in your life going on that bah, 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 hitting on you. And you have to do it all instant. It's not like you can just sit there. So you're always failing. And he's giving you input all the time. Especially in maturation. You know, in your last stage. You're getting input all the time. You're getting input about the meaning of what you're doing. You're getting input about the the future meaning of what you're doing. You're getting input about why the circumstance you got is there. You're getting input about what it is. There's no, it's not like you, it's not that you don't know. In fact, if anything, it's the reverse. You're getting so much information, you cannot process it. And yet you have to keep at, you know, doing at the same time. You're getting information about the lateral world. When you hear, the, for example, the presidential debates, you get all kinds of, um, how do you want to call it, insight into the soul of the person talking. When I read comments in articles, I get all kinds of insight about what was meant by the person behind it. And I'm supposed to slow down, wait for God's answer about how I reply, but a lot of times I don't do that. So that's one of my failings. See, And then you know that it's a failing. In other words, it's really complicated, it's really hard, and it's, how do you want to call it? It's a 24-7 battle all the time. It doesn't end. It's not supposed to end. 10,000 years from now, it'll still be the same. Different topics. Higher level. It'll still be the same. This is the way God lives. And what he's doing is training you in learning how to live that way. And sometimes it's it's so enjoyable you just want to cry. And sometimes it's so painful you just want to die. All day long. Even in your sleep. That's what happened to Christ. 
How do you think he stayed sinless? If this bi-directional communication wasn't going on, he couldn't have stayed sinless. And of course, we sin, use when John and I get back on the horse again. Now, the most important thing that I wanted to cover in this increment is that besides the fact that it's very tiring and yet very energizing and you get to the place where you can't live another way. I mean, you can, but you don't want to. Is the sort of overwhelming awareness of just how true all this stuff is. It's enough to make you faint. And the overwhelming awareness of just how far behind Christians are. And it leads to getting to the place where you know a lot about the future. You're supposed to. That's what makes it hard. Christ had to know every single day he's Messiah. Here's the goal. Here's the objective. Here's where you're going. And God gives you a little more, a little more, a little more every day, and it's crushing. And he was javelin stabbed with our sins. That's Isaiah 53, 5. Okay? But then he, it progresses. Okay? And he sort of had the verb already given in, what was it, verse 4? Ishmaqovot would do a holy, the heartbreak man crushed with lovesick grief. Holy is lovesick grief. It's not just any old grief. They leave out the word lovesick and they shouldn't. Okay, so then you have Isaiah 53.10 where it pleased God, Father, to crush him, Christ, with lovesick grief. Or chafetz, dako, heheli. And God, Hafetz, and God was pleased, really delighted, is the way it should say it. Da to, to, to crush him, Keheli, with lovesick grief. That's, that's it. You end up being lovesick. You end up falling in love with righteousness, like Paul's talking about in Romans 7. You fall in love with it, really in love with it I mean it it, it, it it hurts when you sin because not because God's punishing you but because like Paul's explaining in Romans 7 it's it's not what you wanted you gave into it just like Satan was tempting Christ in Matthew 4 he was trying to shoot past his instincts and to tap instead the normal human instinct of imagining bread. So temptation shoots past your doctrinal instincts to tap your human instincts, and then you see yourself sin, and you're just completely sick. You're love sick about it. God doesn't need to punish you. You're already hurting enough. I don't know if, you know, maybe, hopefully this doesn't happen to you in your life, but for most of us, there are decisions we've made in the past, and we didn't get punished for them. And we're aware that we made a really bad decision, we're aware it was wrong. And maybe other people aren't aware of it, or if you told them they wouldn't care, but it really bothers you. That's the kind of thing. You're, you're developing a divine conscience, a divine love of divine standards, and then you see yourself break them. And you have to survive your own awareness of the truth. Your own awareness of God, your own awareness of the truth, your own awareness of how beautiful the Bible is, your own awareness of how sick the world is and your own awareness of your own failure constantly. Because it's enough to make you faint and want to give up. My guess is, and I'm guessing, this is what really felt Satan. This is why he decided to sin. He wanted relief 
from the constant oppression of seeing how he didn't measure up to the standards he came to fall in love with. I maintain he fell in love with God, he fell in love with the standards, he knew he didn't measure up because you can't ever measure up. And it hurt so much for so long that he finally had to try to blame God so that he could feel better about his own failure. And that's why he finally, you know, decides that God is, you know, somehow being mean and nasty to impose a standard and therefore decides I will make myself like the most high. That's in what Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. In order to be able to say it's not his fault that he feels bad, it's God's fault. Otherwise, how does he sustain his enmity with God for all these, you know, could be billions of years for all we know. So it's a real killer, this battle for integration. This is why Christians don't do it. First of all, everybody's bored when they go to learn Bible. They get bored quickly. We have no tolerance for information. Okay? None at all. And it's hard a whole lot harder than doing a good deed first of all doing most good deeds you're living on your emotion doing most good deeds you're you know telling yourself how good you are but Bible doctrine doesn't have any outward like kudos it doesn't have any outward benefit okay you can't see the results and when you're finally old enough to see the results, you're, you're battling something else. And so you take the results for granted. And you can't, you realize that it's not you're doing it, it's God's doing it, and it's real, and it's happened to you. And so now you feel crushed instead of victorious. There is no, the, the so-called victorious life is learning and living on Bible. That, what was, you just threw that at me, was it? First John 2, when he's talking to little children, he uses the word nakao, means to conquer. You've won. That's what he tells the little children. You, you're a winner. You're a winner. Well, that's all you got is the being told. And when you're a little child, that's easy to accept. But when you're older, it doesn't feel like winning. It doesn't feel victorious. All you can think of is, oh, well, that's nice, but... There's all these other things I don't do well. You just, you keep on pushing away the victory. And when you get really close, you know, in the last stage, he has to start showing you that it's a victory. Because all you can think of is, yeah, but I should do that. Yeah, but I should do that. And I didn't do it well enough. Yeah, because you've fallen in love with righteousness. And you really are failing all the time. So all you look at is your failures. You're not, the success doesn't mean anything to you because you're busy looking ahead at the thing you're not doing well and the thing you are doing well you're taking for granted. Because you fell in love with righteousness. When you really love, you don't think you love. The people running around say, I love Jesus, don't. When you really love him, you don't think you do. You're too busy looking at the things you're not doing that you think you should do because you're already in love with him and you're in love with righteousness and you're in love with the Bible and whatever you do is not good enough. This is what happened, I bet, to Satan. He couldn't live with the discomfort of it. It's a killer life. And it's a constant thought life. The battle's in the soul all the time. It's very tiring. I mean, most people tell me that my audios and stuff like that are too dense, too much, too much information, don't want to read, don't want to know. Yeah, okay, go listen to something else. It is tiring. I'm not saying you should listen. But I am saying it is tiring. You practice over and over and over, and there's no sense of victory. Because you're, it's just never, it's, it's, you need to do it. 
You just need to keep doing it. Katahas kopon dioko. Thank you, Dad. I still rebel. De san oklesius to te un Cristo yes. You keep wanting to go. See, that's Philippians 3.14 again. Listen to the cadence of the Greek because that really helps you understand the point I'm trying to make here. That's why you threw it at me, right? Kata skopon dioko ais to braveon des anoklesius tu te u in Cristo Jesu. See how plotting that is? Kata skopon dioko ais to braveon des anoklesius tu te u in Cristo Jesu. Step one foot in front of the other in the mud. Step one foot of the other in the mud. Kata skopon dioko ais to brabeon teis anoklesius tu teu en Cristo Jesu. Hamburger Hill. In your head. That's the real Christian life. That's the battle for integration. It's very tiring, it's very wearing, it never ends, ever. It will never end. The only difference between today and a billion years from now is that a billion years from now you're going to love it. Sometimes here on earth you love it too. You fall in love with it. You can't do anything else. That's what Paul's saying there. I'm one foot in front of the other. I'm just going to go to the goal. You're tired, but you go. That's true heroism. But it's not your heroism in your mind. To everybody else, when they know you in heaven, it will be. But not to you. Because you're in love with it. And you can't do anything more. What do you think the cross was? I gotta have it. I gotta have it. I gotta have it. Yes, 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 yes. He's being stabbed and stabbed and stabbed. And he keeps on saying yes. Because he wanted to. And it, that, that's all that there is in your head. Just yes. Just go. Kata skopon dioko. Onward to the goal I march. Kata is according to. Onward. Skopon to the goal. I march. That's a standard actually. Onward to the standard, I march toward the big, like, flag goal. Brave. Because there's no other meaning in life to you. That's what a true soldier does. When they're in the battles, when they fight, when they're in a firefight, they just keep going. There's no sense of glamour. There's no glamour. There's no sense of victory. You're fighting to win, but you're not thinking about being a winner. You're not thinking about how good you are. It's just fire, 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 fire. And you don't have but two seconds to think about something. You have to make snap decisions on very little information right then. And that's where your doctrinal instincts have to be. And unless you do it over and over and over and over and repeat, 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 it ain't going to happen. And that's the integration process. That's the battle of it. Now, as you can guess, or hopefully realize by now, that's a whole lot harder than good deeds. It's a constant. And it's always a failure. And there's no... There's no one patting you on the back. And you don't even want to be patted on the back. That's the cross. You just do it. And to not do it, you can't even... You, it, it, it's not even an admissible thought. And whatever it is you do, you're critical of it. It's not as good as I could have done. I better do it again. That's true heroism. That's why we got the freedom we got in America. Because soldiers thought that way on battlefields, both in this country and outside this country. 
through the centuries. And the same thing is true for any other country that exists right now. Well, most of them. Freedom is only won by fighting, and the fighting is constant. God designed it that way. And that's why Satan finally, you know, he wakes up, as it were, one morning and says, Hey, you designed this to be this hard. And that's when he started to say to himself, Well, something must be wrong with God. Why would he design it this way? Why am I beating myself up? Maybe there's something wrong with him and wrong with everything he's telling me is right. And then, of course, you know, by Satan's own standard. As far as he's concerned, he sees the feet of clay in God. God really needs to be saved from himself. And Satan thinks he's the guy to do that. What else could motivate him to keep on fighting for all these thousands upon thousands upon maybe millions or billions of years? What else could do that? Okay, but if that's that tells you how strong the fight gets when you believe in God too. Satan's strength is because he's believing that something's wrong with God. Okay, so if that's the strength that comes from disbelieving God you see, what kind of strength could be coming from believing the God you see? And then you start to realize Katas Kopondioko is telling you something about how Christ endured the cross and why we don't sin in eternity. Because it is a struggle. Eternity is free. The difference is you learn to love it somehow. And the truest love is that just basic ba 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 that same cadence in Philippians 3:14 ba 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 okay and that's all you do is one foot in front of the other and to do something else is inconceivable. So when you screw up as you will because you don't have the total integration ever in this body. It's just devastating. You can't live with yourself. So next time you're tempted to look out at, you know, church inanity. And see how crazy they are, especially because, you know, 99.9% .9 of Christianity is just, in the United States anyway, is just completely wacko. You have to be completely wacko to vote for either Trump or Cruz, period. They're all going after those two. Oh, they'll save us. They'll make America great again. Baloney. The only ones who can make America great again are the believers. And we ain't going in that direction. If you think voting for some candidate for president is going to make America great again, you better go look in the mirror of the Word of God because you've forgotten what your face looks like. And that's where they're headed. So... The secret to this thing is to recognize that this inner battle is the real war. It's harder. Christianity's failing it by doing their good deeds. And so the next time you get tempted to think that you're not doing anything, you're not doing great things for God, then go look in the mirror. Because he's in you. You got doctrine in you. That's your value. And that's worth more than all the good deeds on the planet. Talk to him about that. Use 1 John 1 9 and talk to him about this. See for yourself. Peace out. <laughs>